Yeah. I mean, as Benjamin Franklin said, intelligence without hard work is like silver in the mine. You can be the most brilliant person, but if you're not constantly working to be a better version of yourself, you're ultimately going to fail. And like you said, I think a lot of young people especially see themselves as victims to a system that wants to take over their lives. But in reality, I believe in the American dream. I think that what matters is hard work. What matters is constantly trying to get better. You know, in school, I wasn't always the smartest person, but I did have the best work ethic. And that's something that I've created for myself. I have a very militant work ethic. So that's just something that I have to do on my own. And I have a choice. I can either be a victim and be a passive recipient of my environment, or I can create my own future. And what you do between 15 and 30 years old is what defines your future for the rest of your life. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the channel. My name is Kyle. And today I have a special guest. Her name is Michelle Brodsky. And she is a fascinating young lady. I saw her on Facebook and also on YouTube and TikTok. And she's got some cool stuff out there that I want to promote on her behalf, but just other things as well. And I want to bring her on here real quickly. And Michelle, how are you doing? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me, Kyle. I'm very excited for this opportunity. Well, I, I, I am very glad that you could come on because I want to promote people like yourself who are Sounds like you're just getting started in a conservative movement, but at the same time, you're not, right? You've done things before. I mean, can you tell us the audience about yourself and how you got into the conservative movement? Yeah, absolutely. So both of my parents are from the former Soviet Union. They came here in 1976 and 1978, respectively. Uh, my first language was Russian. So from the time that I was in kindergarten, <laughs> I already understood that socialism is infeasible and destructive if tried. So I've been involved in politics my entire life. Um, I have four years of formal grassroots experience and I'll be going to law school in the fall. Wow, okay, I did not know that about you. I, that is incredible. Can you expound a little bit more about the, I'm gonna go off, off, off script here a little bit. That's just too fascinating for, to not bring up. So you speak Russian fluently. Yeah. And uh, tell us a little bit about, can you expound upon a little bit, your, your press came over, it said 70, was it 76 and 78, was that? Yep. Okay. Can you tell us about, about their experiences and how it affected you and how they came over? Yeah. So when my mom was three years old, she came home from preschool and told her mom that she heard some girls sing, singing yid yid jump on the rope. And if and yid is a it's a slur for a Jew. So that was kind of a microcosm of how Soviet Jewry was treated in the Soviet Union um, and no religious freedom. Jews couldn't serve in higher office. They couldn't practice their religion openly. Um, any kind of dissenting political opinions were, you, you had terrible consequences. And I see a parallel between what happened there and what's happening here. And I think that that kind of just motivated me to fight back. There you had no gun rights, no freedom of speech. There were no checks and balances. And just seeing how quickly America is moving in the same direction as what was the final fate of the USSR is terrifying. Well, I am, I am old and I was actually alive when the Berlin wall came down. And so I was about six years old when your parents came over. So growing up, just a little bit of history, you probably know this already, but we were terrified of the Soviet union because it was the Soviet union. Right. And so, but now it seems as if we've kind of lost, I don't know, I don't know if it's the rivalry so much, but we've lost the values that kept us separate from, I guess, the communist nation. Can you, can you talk to us a little bit about the things you're seeing, what's coming on this country that you've maybe grown up with and now you're seeing change? Yeah, I mean, 10, 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, there was no such thing as mandatory pronouns. Um, so the Overton window, which describes the sphere of acceptable thought, has shifted to the left dramatically. Now we're seeing students that are getting penalized and ostracized for having dissenting views. I don't even want to publicly announce where I'm going to law school because I'm afraid that somebody's going to try to dox me. Right. Um, and in the past, that just wasn't the case. Universities used to be bastions of free speech. And now if you don't hold the same view as your professors or as the institution, then you're going to be repudiated. And it's absolutely ridiculous. We can't even have conversations anymore. Um, between that and just the federal government constantly overreaching. I mean, even, you know, Roe v. Wade. 
I don't care if you're pro-life or pro-choice. The fact of the matter is that the federal government hasn't shouldn't have any say in the abortion debate. That's a state's rights issue. So this delicate system of federalism that our founding fathers created has just been thrown to the wayside. Um, when it comes to guns, when it comes to free speech, when it comes to the Tenth Amendment, where all of our money is going, I have no idea where my taxes are going. Do you? No. Not at all. <laughs> it's very. Yeah. It's very frustrating. I, I, on a side note, I, I would be support a fair tax, um, but that's neither here nor there. But yeah, what you just said there was very eloquent. And I, I can tell you do have a lot of experience and you have a good formulative ideas that you want to do. I'm not going to tell you, ask you what you want to do, because again, that could be used against you. <laughs> if you say you want to do something in the, in the future, people can say, well, no, she's not. We're going to go after her. It's, it's sad. It's really sad that people can't even say what they want to do and how they want to do it. Um, but I do want to ask you this question. You are involved in some organizations. I saw that you're involved with a, a, comp, a group called the Young Americans for Liberty. Is that correct? Yeah. So I've worked at Young Americans for Liberty for four years, almost um, three years in an official capacity, one year as a volunteer. But actually, Monday's my last day and I'm going to be oh. moving on to being an investigative journalist for a conservative think tank, which, again, I'll publicly announce once I start. That's awesome. That's fantastic. Uh, I'm involved with a group called Red Liberty Media, and they are similar. I'm not sure if it's similar what you guys are doing, but they're upstart. They've only been around about a year. And I think it's really important for independent journalism. And that brings me a nice segue into some of your videos and the content that, that you put out, because I think you mentioned, I'm not sure if I saw this on one of your feeds about independent journalism. But if you, if you hadn't, can you just comment on what your thoughts of the future in terms of independent journalism as compared to the old centralized East Coast, West Coast type of deal? We're going to need more independent journalists like Project Veritas and what they're doing, because right now you can't really trust either side. Sure, the Republicans are a little bit better, but not by much. It, it seems to be a lot of um, brainwashing on both sides. You know, there are a lot of people who support Trump, but can't explain why they support Trump. And to me, that's a huge problem. Right. I mean, I, I like Trump. I had problems with him. Sure. But I can tell you exactly why I have those problems and conversely why I like him. But I think that a lot of people are just regurgitating what they hear on both sides um, and we can't trust our news sources we don't know if what they are saying is true um, so independent journalists actually going out there and finding the facts for themselves is going to become a paramount importance i think in the next couple of years especially have you trained in this area and or in getting to where you are now is it um or this something you just worked hard at or you're just naturally talent, talented like that in writing you mean well, I mean, just in your presentation, because I watched your videos as well. Yeah, in writing and in your presentation on your YouTube and TikTok videos. Um, I think it's really just practice. When I was in high school, there was one boy who was actually a socialist and he would always bully me. He hated me. But I remember watching him go up on stage and I was just impressed with how he was able to speak without having any kind of note cards or anything. Um, and at that time I was very shy. I wasn't shy. I was never shy, but I wasn't the best public speaker. I participated in mock trial in high school. I was the president of mock trial. And, you know, I, I was really nervous. I didn't do a very good job giving my presentations, but as I got involved in politics and as time has gone on, I think I've gotten better at public speaking. And that's something that I've had to work pretty hard at. And this is what I want to get into a little bit. That's why I asked you the question, because I want to encourage more young people like yourself to kind of follow your lead. I mean, because I think and you for, let me go back a little bit. You make a really good point about on both sides, people just regurgitating talking points. OK, and it's what is different between talking points and be able to articulate what those talking points are about. And so that's why I appreciate what you're doing and that you learn sounds like by trial and error and hard work. And so uh, just people who are watching young audience or any people who are older, like myself, who started a YouTube channel, couldn't talk anyway. I just just did it. And eventually I, I got a little better, I guess. <laughs> but can you talk a little bit about hard work and effort and how that can get you ahead because a lot of people see themselves as victims and not being able to do anything because I can't do it. I'm too old. I'm too young. I'm too what? Yeah. I mean, as Benjamin Franklin said, intelligence without hard work is like silver in the mine. You can be the most brilliant person, but if you're not constantly working to be a better version of yourself, you're ultimately going to fail. And like you said, I think a lot of young people especially see themselves as victims to a system that wants to take over their lives. But in reality, I believe in the American dream. I don't think it matters what gender you are since there's now 72. It doesn't matter what your race is. It doesn't matter what your creed is, your sexual orientation, your religion. I don't think any of that matters. 
matters. I think that what matters is hard work. What matters is constantly trying to get better. You know, in school, I wasn't always the smartest person, but I did have the best work ethic. And that's something that I've created for myself. I have a very militant work ethic. And I think that that's kind of what's allowed me to be in the position where I'm in, where, you know, I'm 23, going to law school, working a full-time job. It's not because my parents come from, that I come from money. My parents, unfortunately, aren't able to help me pay for college or law school. So that's just something that I have to do on my own. And I have a choice. I can either be a victim and be a passive recipient of my environment, or I can create my own future. And what you do between 15 and 30 years old is what defines your future for the rest of your life. Well said. Well said. You know what? Um, my son, I want my son to meet someone like you when he gets older because I'm terrified of who he's going to meet and, and uh, date. Well, I don't really want him dating. I want him to marry. <laughs> but exactly. That, you know what I mean? I want him to find the person he's going to marry and that's it. But um, I just, I want, I'm kind of doing this on his behalf too. <laughs> I'm trying to create a future for him. So, um, and my other kids too. So, okay. So yeah, let's, let's talk a little bit about, well, let me ask this question real quick. I was thinking about this. You mentioned Benjamin Franklin. And just off the cuff, if you if, if you don't know, that's fine. Who is your favorite founding father? Or I don't know, I guess what what the other for a woman would be founding. I mean, like Abigail Adams or anybody like that. Who's your, who's your favorite person who helped raise this or build this country? James Madison, I think he asked questions that everybody was afraid to ask. So it's funny because James Madison was the he was the one who wrote both the Bill of Rights and the Constitution, but. We James Madison was actually afraid of the Bill of Rights because he feared that if we don't, if we specifically enumerate all of our God given rights, yep. the government will get the false impression that all their rights are theirs to breach. And I think things would probably have been a lot worse if we didn't have the Bill of Rights. But yep. the, the fact that he was able to take that into consideration and kind of have this nuanced approach to where we need to go is really fascinating to me. Yeah, you know what? I'm glad you brought that up because most people don't know that he actually he and Jefferson kind of were like, you know, whatever. Jefferson was a little bit more radical toward that, and and Madison had to kind of calm him down a little bit. Look, dude, no, we're not gonna we're not gonna secede, okay? But you're right. He was like, it's almost like if you invite a plumber into your house, hey, dude, fix my sink. Just and but if if he does that, he said, what about your what about your closet? What about your what? You know, what about your you know? If you put something in there, then say whatever, then they have to, they can limit it based on what you specifically told them to do. But if you don't say anything, it's intentionally, inherently God given. So it shouldn't have to be put on paper. So it's a good intellectual framework to even think about. So, um, cause we see it now with the Supreme court rulings right now, right? With the whole thing with, with gun rights. I mean, I don't even think this particular ruling should even gone to the Supreme court, but it's, but here we are. I just made a video about that two minutes before um, I was here. I actually made a 30 second video and I was like, the fact that this has gone to the Supreme Court is indicative of the moral turpitude of our nation um, because it says keep and bear arms. So obviously carrying a gun is a constitutional right. Same with the main Supreme Court decision that just came out. I love it. I love it. I, 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 uh, I am so impressed by you. I tell you, thank you. I, 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 at 23 years old, I was an idiot. Um, <laughs> I doubt that. <laughs> well, I was a, a black militant in college, coming out of college, and you don't want to know about it. If, if it wasn't, if it wasn't for 9/11 and some common sense and the Bible and you know, my faith, I would have been. Who knows where I would have been? But, but um, anyway, not about me. I want to talk about you more. So, so okay, let's get into some uh, policy issues, I guess. Um, and before, I then I want to get into some of your uh, videos because I watched about four or five of your videos. I think I watched about six or seven because they're pretty short. They're very, yeah. very good. They're very good and they're very informative. You can watch them. You can keep going. You can get nuggets. And I learn a lot from your videos. Um, let's talk about a little bit of policy. What amendment do you think is the most important amendment? Uh, I guess Bill of Rights, I would imagine. The Second Amendment because it protects all of the rest. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that as well. Um, in terms of um, the, uh, the Bill of Rights, in terms of where it is now, do you think that we can get back to the premise of, let's say, relegating things to the states? And, and how do you think, since you know so much about the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, I'm sure you know a lot about the uh, uh, the, the Federalist Papers as well. Can you kind of tell us um, how we got to where we are in terms of the slippery slope of federalism intrinsic to our rights? Do you have an idea of how that happened? Yeah, I mean, I think it started out really because of the culture war, which has been going on for the last 60, 70 years. Um, I think first we passed the 16th Amendment, then we passed the 17th Amendment. So we're slowly chipping away from the original intent of the Constitution. And I think that people just see it as this antiquated document written by a bunch of old white men. Um, 
And then slowly but surely, people just don't care. I think that that's really what it comes down to. They want to create their own rights. They want to be victims. They want to feel sorry for themselves. And then what they're going to do is they're going to go back and blaming the con- blame the Constitution for not protecting their rights. But if we're electing people who don't care about the Constitution, then you can't go back and blame the document itself. Yes, so true, so true. So um, what do you think about in terms of just uh, the culture in general? You mentioned the culture war. Uh, what do you think is our biggest issue in terms of what we have going on now? Is it transgenderism? Is it, is it multiculturalism? Is it apathy? Is it uh, victimization? Is it these groups like BLM and Antifa? Or is it something more, is it something that's more fundamental, like just families not being together and, and fatherlessness going on? Which is, I know it's a big wide, broad question for you, but just at open uh, to that uh, thought that you may have in terms of where we are in terms of our, our biggest problems in terms of culture war. Yeah, I would say two things. I would say one, education, and two, fatherless homes. I think that the white liberals have essentially taken the fathers out of those homes because of the welfare state. Now it's you're incentivized to not be married. And I think that, as Ben Shapiro said, there's three things you need to do in order to not fail in life. Graduate high school and get married before you have children. So I think that tells you everything you need to know. They're they're taking fathers out of the home and they're replacing them with the government. Um, And, you know, statistics show that children that don't have fathers do a lot worse in life with drug addiction, with being in jail, with failing out of school, with drinking. I do think that gay people should be able to adopt just because we have so many children who have nowhere to go. But, you know, biologically, a a baby is going to do best with both the mother and the father in the home. Um, So I think that that's one major issue. And then education, public schools have been failing for the last 30 years, if not more. And it's the definition of insanity. We're doing the same thing over and over again, but we're hoping for a different result. We need school choice. We need parents to decide where they want to send their children because these kids are going to school. They're learning absolutely nothing. Then they're going to college. They still don't know how to read or write. And then that's driving up the cost of education. They were falling behind in math and reading. And in the process, they're learning to hate their families. And I think that that's what kind of uh, combines what I said with uh, education and then also with families. I think the schools are positioning students against their families. Michelle, (laughs) I got nothing for you. (laughs) That's absolutely fantastic. I agree with 100% everything you said there. Um, but let's let's stick with education here because you're obviously in school. You're going to you're going to law school. Tell us about the culture right now. I have a daughter who is 18, and she is a Christian, but she's tearing on that whole thing of being conservative and being like center to left because her friends and so forth. So, what is the pressure on people? Or just tell me what the col- the culture is or the climate where you are in your circle of 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 people, young people. Yeah, um, young people don't like me. I mean, I I have friends, but I would say that a lot of my friends have similar political views as I do, or if not, at least they're open and minded enough to have a discussion because there's nothing wrong with being a liberal. There's something wrong with being a leftist, in my opinion. But if somebody's a liberal or a left leaning libertarian, I'm not going to automatically say I won't be friends with you. But a lot of people simply don't like conservatives. Um, I mean, through Young Americans for Liberty, I've helped to overturn several unconstitutional free speech codes back when I was a state chair. And yeah in total has overturned 99 free speech codes right now, I think, 99. And the fact that there are so many unconstitutional free speech codes throughout the nation, quite literally free speech zones that are located by the dumpster that you have to get prior permission to speak at or you have to stay inside of this tiny little zone. Um, They're encouraging students to... Yeah. Okay. Okay, continue. I'm sorry to cut you off there, but just continue, please. I'll just shut yeah, there, there are lots of schools throughout the nation that have these free speech zones where you need to either get prior permission or you have to stay in the little circle. Otherwise, you get in trouble. Oh, oh my gosh. This is, yeah. been, okay, a private school, I mean, but public school, there's no grounds for that at all. Exactly. What's and that's what Yao primarily focuses on because, again, with private property, you might be able to get them on breach of contract if they guarantee free speech. But the public yeah. university, that's an infringement on the United States Constitution. You can't do that. 
Um, in my classes, I've had people report me to the teacher because I offended them. And I've never said anything inappropriate. I mean, I'm talking like I talk now, right? But they get yeah. insulted. They don't like what I have to say. At one point, our professor taught us that the Nazis were a right wing movement. And I it was like, they're the Nationalist Socialist Workers Party. It's an authoritarian regime founded on identity politics. What are you talking about? And of course, the entire class freaked out. There was a Candace Owens event at a nearby school and people were crying in the back. Like wow. it's the no one wants to hear opinions that aren't theirs. That's what it comes down to. What do you think is the reason for that? I don't really know why kids can't cope with new information is the, 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 uh, the, the, the fight or flee is mostly flee. Why is, why do you think it's like that? Is it, is that something that my generation and my parents' generations are responsible for or what's going on? Well, I can't say that's all their fault because I think that they have been coddled. Right. Um, I mean, we used to have 18 year olds on the shore of Normandy and now there are 18 year olds under the table crying. But I right. think that they don't have to worry about anything. In previous generations, people had to worry about going, spending eight hours or 12 hours on the farm, making sure they have enough food for their families. But now with all these modern conveniences, they don't have to worry about anything, which means that they can sit there and be existential all day and come up with these crazy ideas about the way that the world should be in the name of equity. Dude, this is an amazing interview. I love this, what you're saying. I think, and I'm learning so much from you because I hadn't even given you much thought, but I think you're, you're square on the target right there. So um, that's wonderful. So without telling us where, you, where you're going, because I don't want to know, I don't ask personal questions unless you volunteer them, but do you have an area do you mind talking about in terms of where you want to focus in on, on law or tell you what, or do or, or a big project that you, that you are interested in or a big issue that you really want to focus in, or is it just... Um, a, being a pundit across all, you know, facets of conservatism in your writing and your in your talking and your videos. Yeah, I mean, for the foreseeable future, for the next three years, I plan on still being involved in politics. I'm not sure what kind of law I want to go into yet. Um, constitutional and civil rights really appeals to me, but I'm also interested in criminal and corporate. So I really have no idea where I want to go yet. Maybe one day I'll run for office. But I think that if, you know, I would love to be a justice on the U.S. Supreme Court. I think that would be awesome. But um, in the meantime, I'm going to be focusing a lot on energy for my new job. I'm going to be focusing on health care and education. Energy. Let's talk about that a little bit with these gas prices the way they are. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your thoughts on that? Just in gas prices in general, just. So well, people say, oh, well, the president doesn't doesn't control inflation, but the president controls the supply chain. What do you think is going to happen when we rely on other countries for oil? Well, we could be getting our own prices are going to skyrocket. But I think that energy is an important topic that not that many conservatives talk about. Like, for example, climate change. Climate change is real. Do I think that we're causing the bulk of it? No. But, you know, these things do exist. I do think we should be looking for alternative sources of energy, primarily nuclear energy, in my opinion. Um, but, you know, these are important issues because eventually we are going to run out of oil, probably not in the near future. But, you know, these are issues that we should be talking about. And I find energy policy really fascinating. My thought is that at some point in time, we're going to find the solution that we'll find the solution before we run out of oil. Do you think that's a do you think that's a reality or do you think it's at that critical existential that we're going to be you know dead in 10 years because of which I, I know how I feel. And I don't think you feel that way, but I'm just saying it as a straw man argument. Yeah, I don't think we're going to be dead in anywhere close to 10 years. Right. Um, I think that you can't force something onto the market that the market is not ready for. Like even these electric cars, first of all, they still use lithium batteries. It's not actually solving the problem. But more than that, it takes six months for the government to de deliver your Tesla. People don't have six months to wait when they need to go to work or to school every day. So, and there's not enough charging stations across the country. The market isn't ready for it. If the government didn't subsidize them, I don't know if, you know, Tesla would have been as popular as it is. So I think that one, we should continue re uh, looking for alternative sources of energy because solar and wind power energy are not going to cut it. Um, and when we come up with something, then we can introduce it into the market. But right now, it's premature. We just don't have the technology for it right now. That's fantastic. That's why I kind of brought that question up because I figured you go in that direction because I think you're right. We haven't gotten to the point now where it's it's the infrastructure is in place where everybody can have an electric vehicle. And if we do have one, is it reliable? I'm hearing this takes up to six to eight hours to charge them up. And if you're in the middle of the highway and you're, and you're down, what happens then? So I mean, I don't think, like you said, we're ready for it yet, especially our military. 
um, especially with other areas like natural gas that, that like uh, waste management, converting their trucks into um, natural gas vehicles, which is very efficient. We have tons of natural gas. And I think a lot of it's just political. And I, I think that the Biden administration is trying to placate to the far extremists, environmentalists that really don't have any science behind their uh, theatrics. So um, what are your thoughts on that? I agree. I mean, it's all of the, again, Overton window. It's all this pressure to move everything to the left by all of these special interest groups. He, he needs to win his reelection. Not that that's going to happen because it's Joe Biden, but um, yeah, he, he wants to win his reelection. So he's trying to, in some ways, try to appeal to the radicals in some ways to try to come off as a moderate. No, no, we're not trying to take your guns away. Yeah, actually you are, but he's not going to say that because then he's going to lose the moderate vote. Right. Right. He's trying to play politics. But the fact is, he's alienated so much of this base. Well, actually, help, Trump helped him do that because they hate him so much. They moved to the left of Trump and now they kind of have a 30 percent local following. But that's all they have, really. And they're trying to get that additional 25 percent to come back in there in their in, in the corner. I'm not sure if they're going to be able to do it. But um, so let me, what is Overton's is it Overton's corner? Overton window. Overton window. What is that exactly? Yeah. So um, the Overton window is the sphere of acceptable thought. So, for example, in 1850, part of the Overton window was slavery. If you run on a platform of slavery today, you're a bigot and idiot and no one's going to vote for you. Um, you know, 10 years ago, part of the Overton window was not mandatory pronouns. But now that's the, that's part of what's acceptable in our modern society. So the idea is that we want to move the Overton window back to the right. They want to move it to the left. But the establishment, all these special interest groups, they're always trying to pressure politicians, even on our side, to move the Overton window back to the left. So it's kind of just how um, politics changes over time and what's considered to be an acceptable view. That's very interesting because I get a lot about the Southern strategy being a, a myth, which I, I, I've done videos on this and talked about it. And that would be the Overton window because at the time when Lee Atwater, who was a political strategist for Ronald Reagan, he also helped Nixon, I believe, as well. But he actually was like, look, you know, the, the time that slavery was slavery, <laughs> segregation was actually dying out in the South around the uh, late 50s because people were more concerned about how about Russia, you know, the Cold War, you know, Cuban Missile Crisis. They're worried about, mm -hmm. you know, they're worried about um, upper mobility. They're worried about having you know, a strong national defense and being able to provide for the families in a way that's not related to racism. And it was dying on the vine. And that's what the Republican Party was trying to tap into. Go after the non-white Democrat races and bring them over. And say, hey, you guys can come over. It's OK. And they went what they tell you is in a revisionist way is that now nah, Republicans were just going after the white races. No, we were going after the ones to say, like Martin Luther King said, if we show them the dog hoses, we show the water hoses, we show all this stuff, then we will shame America into coming our way because it's a God given, um, it's a God given um, things inside of us that will allow us to go there. So I'm going to give you the last um, time on this, but can you talk to me a little bit about uh, the, the, the spirit of this country in terms of, um, I'm not sure what your what your faith is or what what your um, what you believe in that that guard, but in terms of just God in general, or the way the founding fathers looked at it, in terms of at least and nothing else, a higher power being over us and giving us our rights so that we can have a culture that's going to be uh, available for everyone without having um, you know issues that we have today. Yeah, so I'm Jewish. I was Orthodox for most of my life. Actually, I hope to go back to being Orthodox very soon. Um, but I think that our rights come from God. They don't come from government. They don't come from any other human being, and they're inalienable. We're born with them. And if you don't believe in God, then those rights come from the nature of being a human being. I think that the sad fact of reality is that people are moving farther and farther away from religion, and that's a problem on its own accord. But you can not believe in God and still believe in that we have rights and sure. there used to be a humanitarian form of atheism where they still loved humanity and they still you know thought that we were capable of greatness but nowadays the atheism has become even more cynical than it has before it's i don't believe in god and therefore I, humans don't we're, we're animals we're the same as animals and i don't believe that and i think that that's why free speech is so important it's the godliest part about humanity it's the ability to speak our words into action that's something that no animal can do to decide right from wrong um and our society is becoming more and more atheist more and more liberal and 
I think it's up to us. I mean, up to parents. I, I don't have kids yet, but you know, one day it's up to us to educate our youth properly and to take back our country because I believe in God and I think that I don't think it should be forced on anybody, but I do think it should be at least some in some way a part of our culture. Um, it doesn't have to, it shouldn't be, you know, there shouldn't be legality and morality are two separate things. You know, there are things that are legal that are immoral, like cheating on your wife, but people wouldn't do that if they believed in God. And wow. I think that that's, what's really causing all of this moral decadence. Wow. That's really great. Quick question. I'm just wanting some uh, clarification. I've heard the term natural law. Is that what you're referring to? If you're not really uh, a Bible thumping Christian or, you know, Orthodox Jew, is that natural law just being a like, common sense that we treat each other uh, fairly and that there's uh, inherent rights to be have? Is that what that yeah, means? Yeah, I was talking about natural rights. So, you know, even if you're not religious, you can still believe that there are things that are wrong and things that are right. So I know a lot of Christians actually use the argument that if it weren't for the Bible, we wouldn't know what's right or wrong. But I actually don't believe that because in Judaism, there are three categories of commandments. And one of those categories refers to something that we would have figured out whether we had the Bible or not. So like, you know, thou shall not murder, for instance. That's something that you would probably figure out even if you weren't religious. Yeah. So a lot of these morals, while, you know, they, they come from the Bible to some degree, they're also just common sense. Yeah, but so, I think some. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. No. Yeah, I think something else that's important is that we have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But people seem to think that you have the right to happiness, and I, I just think that that right. that's not the case at all. I love it. I love it. I love it. That's that's kind of where we got entitlement from. I think we, I need to be happy. You got to make me happy. Give me what I need to be happy. Give me, you know, and that's entitlement. I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. Well, cool. Um. Well, Michelle, you know, this has been a, a pleasure. Let me ask you, I'm going to close out this question here, and then I'm going to let you let everyone know how they can get a hold of you, how they can contact you, how they can help you get through law school. If you have any, any links we can um, send, send your way to help you, support you any way we can. Um, but the question I have for you quickly is, if you had, I ask most people this question on my interviews, if you could do one thing to make the world, um, not, not fix the world, but to get the world on the path to liberty and freedom what would that one thing be you think hmm that's a good question because my first thought i'm tempted to say school choice in all 50 states it shouldn't be a federal issue but i think that each state should willingly choose to institute school choice because really all of the problems that we're having you know the lack of the People don't care about the Second Amendment. They don't care about free speech. You know, the drug war, mass incarceration, uh, the fact that people hate Israel. Like, all of these issues are coming from the fact that our kids aren't being taught anything substantial. They're being taught to hate our country and to hate other people for things that they didn't do. Like, their entire critical race theory, that's like me hating all Germans because a third of my people were killed in the Holocaust. Did those people kill anybody? No. So it, it's kind of just to look at people like Martin Luther King Jr. said, right, to look at people for the content of their character and not their skin color. And I think that that's really what's important to me because I don't think we should be judged for the way that we look or, you know, what religion we are. It's really how you are as a person. And that's not to say that there's not any discrimination. Of course, there's discrimination, but it's not systemic. And that's kind of what I think we need to stress to kids. Would you be willing to come back on, because um, I saw your video about what you said about Martin Luther King Jr. and the content of his character versus con uh, color of your skin, which is basically, it's antithetical to CRT. I mean, it's the exact opposite. So, um, can you, would, you, would you come back on here and, and then chat a little bit more at some point in the future? Yeah, I would love to. I'd be honored to do that, yeah. Yeah, that'd be great, because um, I, I just find what you offer, I'm learning so much from you, because I think... Obviously, you're more skilled and more versed in these issues than I am. Uh, uh, cultural, not well, cultural, yeah, definitely, but also with um, just policy, right? Anyway, so Michelle, can you tell everyone how they can get a hold of you, how they can support you in all your uh, areas of uh, social media that you may have out there? Yeah, um, it's pretty simple because all of my channels are just Michelle Brodsky. It's Perfect. all just Michelle Brodsky. Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, YouTube, it's, it's all the same. I mentioned one quick question because you mentioned on your, this is one of the reasons why I want you on the show was because I want to ask you about what was TikTok doing? Can you can you talk about? Uh, did you say they were doing something to you or banning you or deleting your videos? 
Yeah, they kicked me out of the TikTok creator fund, which means I can't be monetized for my videos. So they refuse to pay me. Um, they keep taking down videos that aren't even controversial. Like I've made controversial videos, but then they take down the ones that aren't even controversial. It makes no sense. Like I think one of the videos was talking about the fact that they're like, someone made a video saying that they shouldn't be teaching religion in school. And I said, yeah, I agree. But and I kind of just commented on it. And a bunch of people mass reported it and they got it taken down. I have people who are just calling me ugly and stupid and fat. And it's just TikTok doesn't ban those people, but they ban me. Do you still have the videos hard coded? Do you still have a downloaded of those? Yeah. Do you, do you still have the videos? or do you? Yeah, yeah, have? I do. Okay, maybe we can uh, do a, a show where we show the videos and we just put them on my Rumble or my um, Locals and we can <laughs> do it that Yeah, way. because if they're and not talk- even anything bad, that's yeah. the thing. Like, I, I don't, they're saying everything is hate speech. There's no such thing as hate speech. Girl, you gotta come back. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I, I don't want to rush you, I mean, rush this no, discussion, but I mean, but man, I really enjoyed this so yeah, much. Yeah, me too. Thank so. you so much. Um, and let me know if, you know, for the next time or whatever, I'd really appreciate it. Okay, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll reach out to you and uh, we'll right. def- set something up. So everybody, I hope you enjoyed uh, this interview with Michelle Brodsky. And I think she's absolutely fascinating. She's going places, obviously. And so uh, please support her. I'll leave the links to her content below. Do you have any uh, Patreon or do you have a, um, do you have any way people could contribute directly to you? Do you have anything like that set up? Yeah, I mean, I can give you my Venmo. I don't have a Patreon or anything like that okay. yet. Because okay. um, I kind of just started with all of this, but I can send you my Venmo, you know, even a dollar or whatever would be appreciated because law school is $300,000. So. Right, right, right. We'll put it all in the links below okay. uh, how we can contribute. I'll throw some in there as well. Um, I, I just want to support what you do because I think we have to encourage everybody to continue what you're doing because it's not easy at your age and what we have going on right now in this country. All right. Well, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Everybody, thank you so much for checking out this video and we'll see you in the next one.